Welcome to the House of Rest Church and Paracletos Ministry YouTube channel, where you're going to hear sermons every single week. We thank you. We appreciate you for subscribing, for clicking. Continue to watch us if you consider this your church. To support us, go to our website, www.houseofrest.com. We thank you. God bless you. And continue. Enjoy the sermon. God bless. And it, I, I, I kind of battled with two different thoughts for a few days. And, and I said, you know, this is, they're both kind of Christmas, Christmas theme messages. But I want to focus on the gift here. And I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 1. Very familiar passage. Many of you have read it. Um, I think many of us should read it during Christmas time to our families to remind them as well. I know we've done that as a family where we've stopped before Christmas gifts and either me or my brother or even my parents have read of why we're sitting around with family. Because if all we're there to sit around with family is just to give PlayStation 4s and Xbox Ones, we've missed the point. <laughs> to our kids, that is the point. But it is our job to instruct them of what the point actually is. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. I'm going to go ahead and read it. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, Lord God, that we can worship with speakers and a microphone and not worry, Lord God, of us being arrested or persecuted here. Father, for there are many right now who do not have that opportunity, but we do. And let us have gratitude in our heart, Lord God, for us. And let us have prayer in our hearts for those that don't. But God, in this moment and in this season, as we're getting ready for, this is the Sunday right before Christmas. Father, I pray that you open our hearts. I pray that you soften our hearts. Lord God, to the needs of our community, to the needs of the people around us, to the needs, Lord God, of those homeless that are cold, that are hungry. Lord God, as well as to our families, Lord God, that we work so diligently hard for, that you have given to us as a gift. Father, we ask you that you remind us about what Christmas is about. Lord God, remind us of what, of what it is that we're doing here. Remind us, Lord God, of why we are here. But more importantly, Lord God, remind us of what we are to do while we are here. Father, we thank you. We ask you to lead us. Let this be your word, not mine. Let our hearts be united, Lord God, around your word. Lord God, and let us be changed this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, first of all, I know to most of us, how many of you guys grew up in church? I, I grew up on, on, literally on the pew. Most of you did. Some of you didn't. I, I was asleep under the pew. I was pinched while I was sitting on the pew. My mom had that Pentecostal pinch that I, I just, I don't know what it was. Because she could pinch me at home and it wasn't the same. But when she pinched me at church, there was just an anointing about it that just hurt more. And, you know, like I'd have to do with my boys at times, my mom would have to do this to me and your pastor. We'd have to separate us. Because if not, we would mess around or he would pick on me and then I would whine and all that good stuff. And just growing up in a church and everything else, well, you heard about Jesus. I heard about Jesus my whole life. It wasn't foreign to me hearing about Jesus. And it's crazy because Jesus is the most controversial name or topic anywhere you go, in any part of the world, 
in any place. And, I mean, you've got um, South Park cartoons portraying their portrayal of Jesus. You've got a, a family guy with a portrayal of Jesus. You've got black Jesus, Asian Jesus, you know, Jesus, Mexican Jesus, you know, <laughs> all, all the different Jesuses that there is out there. And you've got, there's more books written about this man named Jesus than any other topic. There's more movies made about this man named Jesus than anything else. You know, we get right now that the, the, the thing in the news is about the movie where Korea and Sony and they pulled this movie that was about to come out. And that's a big deal, but I guarantee you it's not going to be probably in our history books. But our history is divided by this man named Jesus. You know, uh, B.C., before Christ, A.D., uh, 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 the, the separation of, of the death of Christ after and before is our own calendar, is our own time. Everything we do is centered around this. The biggest holiday in our country is based on Christmas. Black Friday is, is not based on anything else but for Christmas. I mean, I know it's entertainment and network and media and shopping. I get that. But it's all based and focused on Christmas. Everything is, everything is headed that direction. Everything is focused that way. You know, I, in my line of work, we have a lot of clientele, a lot of customers. Some of them know I'm a Christian. Some of them, because I, I get to conversate with them. We've been, you know, I've had the opportunity to pray with people in their homes, different things. Some of them I don't get to conversate with. Uh, but one of, the, one of the clientele that we have is a Islamic temple there in Tracy. And it's interesting to me because we, we get there and the gates are opened at 6 a.m. And it's not 6.15 it's not 620. It is at 555. <laughs> the pastor shows up, opens the gate, opens the building, turns on the heater, turns on the lights, opens the doors, and leaves. He's there for a period of time. He'll pray, and then he'll leave. And we'll be there. We'll show up maybe at 7, 637, 730. And a car will walk in. A car will pull up. They'll come in, they'll pray, they'll walk out, they'll get in their car and they'll leave. And all day long, all day long, every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, they come in and the members of their church, all day long, up until midnight, the pastor goes back, locks up the church, locks up the gate, closes it up, and then he's back again at 555. And he's praying. And the church is praying. And the members are praying. And that's so intriguing to me. Because, you know, let me ask you a question here. Those of you that, that got brought up in church, have you ever felt the presence of God? Yeah. Could you do this? Could you live a Christian life if God never showed up in your life? Think about the tragedies and the trials that you've gone through. Think of the struggles that you have faced. Think of the heartache. Think of everything you've gone through. What was it that got you through it? It was God. But what if you had a religion that you didn't have that part of it? What if you had a, a, a religion, David, that when you were in a dark cell, it was reading a word in rituals and hope that that got you through it? But nothing heartfelt. Nothing heart changed and impact. And yet I see them every day, 24 hours a day, hitting that prayer room, going to that building, and praying to Allah. And I was thinking about that this week because we were there on Thursday, and I seen so many people come through. And you know what? Reality is we hear about Christ. We hear about everything else. Walmart, I know they took out Merry Christmas. Now it's Happy Holidays. Uh, you know, and everything else. And I know my mom is as stubborn as they get because she says Merry Christmas back to all the Walmart employees. 
Amen. <laughs> you know, as they say, happy holidays or Merry Christmas. Yes, sure. <laughs> and, and, and all that stuff. Sure. How easily as Christians we forget what this is all about. You know, I was watching this morning on the NFL Network of player. Some of you might have heard about this from the Cincinnati Bengals. He's got a little girl. And she was diagnosed with cancer, a rare, rare form of cancer. And she, and she had this, this desire that she wanted to, to, to meet. What's the, the princess? Princess Jasmine. Prince, princess Jasmine from uh, Aladdin. Like, is it Aladdin? Anyways, make a long story short, they end up going to Disneyland and they, they Princess Jasmine appears to this little girl. And they did her a princess makeover. And I mean, she has no hair. She's completely shaved. And, and she's just all smiles and everything else. And they were interviewing this football player. And they said, what was the most impactful time of all of this? And he said, when they were doing a makeover on my daughter. And it showed this 320 pound, 290 pound linebacker or defensive end, just tears rolling down his face as he's watching his little girl getting a, putting a, having, having to put a wig on her, makeup, doing a makeup for her, uh, you know, and whole deal so she could meet Princess Jasmine and enjoy the day at Disneyland. And it showed him, and he was just sitting there just, I mean, it, it was amazing to see such a big, strong man. And they asked him, what have you learned through all of this? He said, he said, my daughter has taught me strength. What do you mean? Dude, this dude can bench press 450 pounds. This guy plays like a beast on the field. And he's saying, my five-year-old daughter taught me strength because she always smiles. And he said, I don't remember. Or I did, I said, I never knew what it would be like to not know if next Christmas I would have her. And he said, to me, he says, I've learned that, the, that, that, that beauty it's very different than what I thought because it's portrayed in our media with beautiful hair and, and, and having this complexion and all these outward side of appearances. And he says, my daughter has no hair, but she is the most beautiful young lady that I've ever laid my eyes on. And I was thinking about that and then it reminded me about a song that, I, that I've heard on Christian radio. It's an older song and it was about this father and he was, he's singing a song about his baby that is about to be born. And he says he's waiting for his daughter to be born. And he can't wait and all this stuff. And he's waiting in the waiting room. And, and the doctor comes out. And, and, and he, the father's just so ready. He's like, just, man, I can't wait. I want to see my little girl. I, she's about to be born. I can hold her. And, and, and all this stuff. And the doctor comes up. And he has his head down. And he says, sir, we need to talk. Okay, where's my little girl? Well, come this way. I want to introduce you to her. And he's walking there, and this is a song, and he's kind of telling the story and everything else and what's happening. And then the doctor stops, and he grabs the little girl, and he says, So we did everything we could. Okay? We did, we tried this, we tried that. It was out of our hands. You, there's something wrong with your little girl. And he began to describe to him and tell him her deformity and what was wrong with her when she was born. And finally, the, the song goes that the doctor handed the baby to, this, to her father. And in the song, the father just looks at his daughter and says, wow, she's perfect. And then the song goes on and he says, don't we understand that that is how God views us when we are being held in his arms and when we are broken. We are broken and he looks at us and says, man, my son is perfect. My daughter is perfect. Because we see us through ourselves. We see us through the mirror. We see us through our daily lives. And I don't know what your struggle is going into Christmas. I don't know if your bank account is empty. 
I don't know if your soul is empty. I don't know if your mind is struggling. I don't know where you're at this morning. But one thing I will tell you is that the Father came to send His Son to hold you in His arms. I said, Brother Tony, you're perfect. To sit there and look at you and say, Brother Tony, and I will say this as a brother in Christ, but I love hearing you up there. It blesses me. It blesses me because it's not your raw talent that you're leaning on, though you are extremely talented and God has blessed you with many gifts. But Brother Tony, your heart comes across and that's what blesses us. That's the key. That's the point. That's the reality. That Jesus Christ came as a baby to a young girl who didn't know what to do with it and gave her the news that the Messiah is coming. Good news is coming. Hope is here. Some of you are praying for a job. Continue to pray. Some of you are praying for the restoration of your marriages. Continue to pray. Some of you are praying for your kids. Continue to pray. But the one thing that we cannot get distracted of is the gift that has already been given. Brother Ray, and that's Christ. We've got to look past our struggles and see what was already given to a young Jewish girl who didn't know what to do with it. But just bow her head and say, it will be done. It will be done. We started a study with my kids. Uh, Lee Strobel has a book called The Case for Christ. And they have a kid's version as well. And in that version, it goes through uh, kind of, a, it's for kids. And so you kind of go through the history and everything else and, and, and being able to, to, to show the facts about the reality of Jesus. That there's more to that speaks about Jesus than just our Bible. Because if you're a non-Christian, then this, this is a point that we don't argue with. Because the, the non-Christian says, well, I don't believe your Bible because I believe your Bible is twisted. It was written by men who wanted others to believe that that was true. But what this study does is it goes beyond that and says, okay, fine. Let's look at other writings. Because it all still proves that he's Christ. It also proves that he's real. It also proves that he is that the reality that Jesus came and Jesus died and Jesus resurrected. It all points to that. And through through the reality of that and studying that, you know, we come across a lot of different things of we of we were studying about who Jesus is and what the Bible says that he is. Raise your hand if you would be willing to read a, read a verse for me. I, want, we, I need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight volunteers. Quick verses, one or two verses. Raise your hand. Okay. John 14, 6. Who's next? Anyone else? Honey? Luke 23, 3. Who's next? Raise your hand real quick. John 6, 35. Next. John 4. Verse 25 and 26. And more. Someone else? Anyone else? I need, I need four more volunteers. It's going to be one or two verses each. John 10, 36. I'll read John 10, 11. Anybody else? John 15, 1. Who can read John 15, 1? My mom. And the last one, John 8, 12. Anyone? What was the one you gave me again? <laughs> John 4, 4, 25 through 26. Okay. Who's got John 14, 6? Read it by the time. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No <laughs> man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. Who's got Luke 23 here? I do. Um, Pilate asked him, Is this true that you're king of the Jews? Those are your words, not mine, Jesus replied. He's the king. John 6, 35. Then yeah. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and 
forever believes in me will never be thirsty. Amen. John 4, 25 through 26. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the, that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Okay. Did I, and who's John 10, 36? <laughs> that, that was me, right? Okay. Do you say of no, him whom uh, the Father... That was me. Oh, that was you. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm um, the next I forgive one. you. <laughs> what about the one whom the Father set, up, set apart as this very own and sent him into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's Son. Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. Amen. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. Amen. John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. We went through this list last week. My kids read through it. And I asked them after this, I said, what, what do you think about that? What do you think about him called truth, life? What do you think about him being called the bread of life? What do you think about him being called the son of God? What do you think about him being called? All these different names and all these different titles and all these different things that represent who he is. And one of the things my kid said, it's a very simple answer. I said, Dad, I didn't know that he was those things. I, didn't, I never heard that before. Because there's something impactful about other than just hearing it in church, but hearing it in your bedroom at home. And for them to hear that, and for them, we had about a 45-minute conversation, a little Bible study with the kids. And being able to walk them through as they were able to, and I asked them, okay, what does that mean to you? Bread of life. Um, he's our food. Yeah, he's our source. What does that mean? He is the resurrection and the life. We all die one day. What does that mean? Well, that there's hope. Something coming later. So then it, remind, it brings us past where we're at today to something coming down the road. A hope. A future. And all these things. And I say that to remind you in this Christmas that He is those things. He is those things to you. He is those things to your neighbors even though they may not know that he is. He is those things to your family. When you, when you sit down on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, as you, as you break open a turkey or tamales or menudo, whatever you do, as you're doing that, remember that the people that may be there may not know what you know. Or they may know what you know and they're just like us and they forget. It is our job to remind us and other believers. And this is why we're here. This is why we're here. We're here because, well, God has me here. Sometimes some of us are waiting for God to call us. And God is saying, sitting there going, I'm just waiting for you to move. You don't need a phone call. You don't need an email. You don't need a banner. God's saying, just flap your lips a little bit more than what you do. Can you have, can you have a smile? 
My kids say, Dad, you always look grumpy. And I don't feel like I do, but I guess I do. And that has actually been something that I have actually prayed about, is God, make me more approachable. Make me have a smile. It doesn't always work, and my wife knows that. But God's working on me. He ain't through with me yet. But in this season, I know we were talking over the table the other day, and my dad said, why is it only once a year we give? Why is it only one day? One day a year. It's kind of dumb. If it's just one day, then we just, that we give. And I get that. And then we're talking to me and my brother and said, but man, at least we get that one day to remind us. Church, we have a building. This is not where it ends. This is just one step. The reality is, what do we do outside of here? What do we do outside of the walls in something simple? This Christmas, when you're with your family, I challenge you to say, you know what, guys? Hey, before we do this, can I just read why we're here? Can I turn to the book of Luke and just read it? Mom, dad, brothers, sisters, uncles, cousins, nephew. Can I read the story of why we're here? Because Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the foundation. Amen. Jesus is our future. Jesus is our everlasting Father. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is our refuge. He is our shadow. He, 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 is, he is the cloud that covers us during the sun and when it's hot. And He is the pillar of fire that gives us light when we got no direction. He is everything that we need. He is the restorer of our marriage. Last night, my son, my oldest said, Man, Mom and Dad, you guys have been married 14 years. Nope, get it right, 15. Because it was rough to get here. And that one extra year, I'm proud of it. Because had it not been for him, my first son, the doctor told me, he will never play sports, he will never run, he will never sing, his, his lungs are not connected to his air passageways, he will never be able to do any of those things. Go and tell him that as he's playing today right now in NJB in Manteca on basketball as a starting point guard. Tell my son that. Tell my second son when the doctor came and thought that there was a hole in his lungs and all of these other things. Justin, do you like to sing now? That's right. Tell him that. Tell him. Tell them about what God has done. Because I will never forget sitting in that hospital room when that nurse told me, you can't lift up that incubator. You can't put your hands in without gloves and touch him. He will get sick. And when that doctor left, I raised that thing up and laid hands on my son. And he's now here and doing able to do what God has granted him to do. You can't tell me any different. Or you can't tell my father any different. Walking into Sacramento and saying, son, I can't do anything. These buildings are big. But I know a God that's bigger, David. That's all I can share with you. Yeah. And now your pastor's here and started the church four years ago. Because I sat there when the attorney looked at me and I reminded her afterwards and she said, hey, David's going to serve 25 to life. And then her words said this, and I'll never forget it. Not even God could change the laws. Tell U.S. Congress when they changed the federal laws in the prison right before you were about to sign the documents, the day you were going to sign those documents. And his attorney came running in. David, don't sign it. David, I don't know what, what happened last night, but I couldn't sleep. Something told me to look over your case again. We're not signing, David, because you were going to sign, what, 12, 15 years? 14. How long did you serve? You can't tell me. Literally, God changed the laws in Washington, D.C., in Congress the day your pastor was going to sign his documents to be put away. You can't tell me. Here is a story of a young girl with 
nothing other than a baby being born in a barn. And 2,000 years later, this violent person is not violent anymore. This person who did drugs is not doing that anymore. We got ex-cons. We've got alcoholics sitting here. We've got women that have been abused emotionally, physically, but they're here. You're here. Why? Because there was a baby that was born. In front of us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful. Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. I just want to remind you this morning, as we go on this week, go shopping. Go Christmas shopping. Go to Toys R Us. Go to Macy's, go to Dillard's, whatever you got to do, go do. And that's okay. Oh my God, before the 25th is over, can we gather as families at home? Can we look at our children in the eyes and say, it's not about any of this stuff. This stuff is good. It's okay. I tell my kids this all the time. Do you know how lucky you are to have mom and dad home? And I don't mean that in just an empty statement. I mean that because that could have been a reality that they did not have. But for those kids that don't have mom and dad at home, they still got a mom and they still got a dad. And for those kids and for the, even you adults that didn't have a mom and a dad, my father didn't know his mother. She passed away when he was a year and a half, two years old. I say this to you. Through all of those names, what did he say? He came for what? He came for us. You don't have a mom and a dad? Run to Jesus. You were abused? Run to Jesus. You're sad and depressed? Run to Jesus. Amen. And I close it by saying this. Test one out me. I don't want to embarrass my son. And it's not an embarrassing story what I'm going to tell you, so don't worry about it, Justin. It's all right. It was a youth service a couple years ago at Grace and Tracy. Uh, we popped in towards the end. Charlie, who was here last week, was preaching. And I just felt a word from the Lord to share with the youth, with, with uh, the young people at our church when we were still attending Grace and Tracy. And I brought out and just kind of what I was sharing was I felt that some of our kids were hurting themselves or they were depressed. And they were either contemplating or some of them were actually hurting themselves, cutting themselves, strangling themselves. And so I just kind of shared that those kids that were battling with depression. And, you know, you've got 50 teenagers there. I mean, you're going to see some tears. You're going to, it's a lot of kids fat fight with stuff at younger ages than just it's crazy. I don't know how kids deal with depression. I, I, I just wow, you know and a couple kids started coming up and I see my son and my, see, my, my, my kids, they're used to seeing dad up there on the microphone and the platform so it's no big deal watching my kids come up and down since they were little. Since they were little. I remember holding Justin when he was a year and I used to preach in our church and just holding him you know, if mom couldn't be there, mom was doing something else, and, and you know, I had to hold my son, and I'm preaching in the microphone, holding my little boy. So they were used to that. My son comes up, and I look down, and I said, what, what are you doing, Justin? And I looked. The tears were rolling down my boy's face. What's up, you know? What's going on? And he said, Dad, you were speaking to me, too. I'm battling with depression. You're nine. <laughs> what do you mean? Nine years old. Depression. K 
kids were lined up and some of them were cutting themselves. Some of them tried to take pills. Some of them were hurting themselves. Some of them were seriously contemplating suicide as we found out later. And we prayed. We prayed over every one of those kids. We prayed over my son. I laid hands on my son. I had the pastoral staff come and lay hands on my son. And we prayed. And I say that story to say this. Ever since that point in time, my son's been different. Because I don't care where you are at. You run up to God, Tina. God's always responding. I don't care what age you are at. I don't care what you are facing. I don't care if you're a grandma or uh, if you're an adult or you're a child. I just want to remind you this morning, Jesus Christ came because we are broken. If you're broken this morning, welcome to the rest of the year in the right club because you're, about, or you're around a whole bunch of broken people. Can we stand to our feet this morning? Can you close your eyes for a second? And I just want you to think of your family. I want you to think of everyone you're going to see Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. I want you to think about the issues that you know that are in your family. A niece, a nephew, an aunt, an uncle that you're going to see. Maybe it's in your own family. And I want you to lift them up to God for a moment. Can we lift our families up to God for a moment? Father, right now. Yes. Yes. Father, this Christmas. <laughs> thank you for the shoes. Thank you for the sweaters. Thank you for the jeans. Thank you for the video games. Thank you for the toys. Thank you for all that stuff. But none of that stuff, Lord God, heals my family. But God, right now, we pray, we lift our voice as a church for every family member that's going to be, Lord God, sitting around those tables. God, if it's, if it's a word that we speak to them, give us the right words. God, if it's a hug and a smile, God, give us an anointed hug and an anointed smile. Yes. Fathers, we lift our families up. Many of them are broken. Many of them are hurting. Many of them have walked away from the faith. And many of them doubt about our faith. But Father, you are the gift. God, I don't want to give someone my church. I don't want to give someone, Lord God, traditions of what I have learned. But my God, strip it down to the basic and let me give them you. Yes. Help us to give Jesus, help us, Lord God, to give, Lord God, the gift that changed me, the gift that changed my father, the gift that changed my wife, the gift that changed the brothers and sisters that are here. Father, help us to give that gift. That's the gift we give. Father, give us strength. Give us humility. Father, let them see Christ in us. We all struggle. We all have our ups and we all have our downs. But Father, I pray that you give us the strength to live it out. Give us courage to live it out. Give us courage to live it out in front of our children. Give us the strength, Lord God, to pray with our children. Let us not run, Lord God, to the medicine and the doctors before we run to you. Let us not run to the psychologist and the psychiatrist before we run to you. Let us not run, Lord God, to Facebook before we run to you. Let us not run to anything or anyone else before we run to you. Father, help us. 
Help us as a church. Help us as a family. Help us as a body. Help us to remember this Christmas. Lord God, that I know it's not just a slogan, but that you are truly the reason for this season. Give us a love, Lord God, for those that have none. Give us a love, Lord God, for those homeless that just need a warm meal. God, bless us with five extra dollars so that we can buy someone a warm coffee or a burger because they're hungry. Lord God, let us have humility to give. Lord God, because every child should smile during this season. To give a jacket, to give a sweater, to give a bean, to give some food, to give a hug, to give a smile. Father, help us, Lord God, because if all we do is just to help the people that are in this building, we've missed the point. Father, we thank you. Father, we love you. And we appreciate, Lord God, everything you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, New Year's is coming. It's right around the corner. So I just want to say this. What are you going to do in 2015? What are you going to do? How are you going to change it? Where are you going to dig your roots in? Where are you going to dig your heels in? How are you going to do it? God is calling some of you. But I will tell you this as a guarantee. God is waiting for most of you. He's already told you. He's already